and understanding the creative and the blessing that God has put inside of each one of us through our biology, it makes sense that mentally or psychologically, we may separate from the intention of God that he gave to us in our identities and our bodies, but God can bring it all back together. Sex education, how young is too young? Find out on this episode of LED Live. Welcome to LED Live, where we are going to use the light of Christ to expose some darkness. Today's topic might be a little sensitive, but uh, we're going to talk about sex education. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. You've been on our show before, so if you haven't seen some of his videos, uh, maybe click through some of our old videos. We'll put the links on there below. Awesome. But um, thank you and welcome back. Thanks. Good to be here. This is uh, going to be an interesting topic. Yeah. I want to know this information because as, as, as we are all parents at the table here, um, I mean, when is it appropriate to talk to your kid about sex? That's, sure. that's kind of, I think, a general question for young parents. It's interesting because um, <clears throat> I think a lot of the times the questions that we get a lot, a lot is about whether our presentations are appropriate for children. And mm. if they share it with their children, how old do their children have to be? Uh, to benefit from the program without being instructed on sexuality, uh, but what is the foundation? And so this has been a question in my mind for as long as we've been in ministry. For those uh, who don't know, what is your ministry real quick? Sure. Uh, Coming Out Ministries uh, is a uh, 10-year anniversary this year, and right. we're celebrating not only talking about the LGBT issue, which all of my colleagues and I have experienced, but it's got much broader since the moment that we began uh, talking about sexuality. People would come up and say, you know, I'm not gay, but I certainly relate to what you're talking mm -hmm. about. We realize now that it's a um, uh, present truth talking about sexuality, identity, which are all the things that the world is screaming about. Yeah. So coming out ministries is really, I think, morphed into something much broader talking about sexual purity. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, we get invited to uh, schools, to academies, universities, colleges, pastors retreats, women's retreats, singles retreats. And um, unfortunately, I think one of the big uh, misnomers about coming out ministries is, is that we're going to expose children to sexuality that they're not ready for. Mm. Um, what I really find blinding about the church today is that they don't even have a clue that mm -hmm. their children are already on YouTube and oh, yeah. all of these uh, social networks, and they are much more educated than even adults are. Or being taught in school. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. There's an agenda even in school, mm -hmm. which has come into light more recently mm -hmm. uh, and coming out ministries uh, recognizes that now we have school systems in countries around the world that are mandatory to have that in their education system. As a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that up. I was recently in Europe and in some of the European countries it's mandatory to have sex educators come into the school and they usher the students or the teachers out and they what? leave only the students and the sex educators speak directly to the children wow. talking about masturbation, homosexuality, uh, identity, now, and these kind of things. Now, why would you not want the teacher there? That's what I was Because wondering. it's awkward? Is the teacher going to stop you or something? I don't know. I think, you know, so that the children aren't inhibited by the teacher's opinions or mm, thoughts or whatever. That makes sense. Like, and, yeah, so they'll feel more ask free to ask. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've always heard in, in our ministry, we talk a lot about technology and stuff. And, and a lot of times when we speak, people will say, well, well, what age is appropriate for your kid to have a phone? And I've always heard it say, 47. Um, well, no, I've always, I've always heard it say the second that you're, you're willing to let your child look at pornography. Yeah. Wow. wow. What? I mean, it's like, whoa, whoa, so... whoa, because it's only a matter of time before, you know, a young person actually has the device. And if it can be connected to pornography in some way, they will get exposed to it yeah. at some point. Uh, you have options. You don't have to give them a smartphone. That's right. Black That's right. Something. Flip phone. Yes. <laughs> a smartphone. Actually, that I should clarify. That was dealing with when when should my child have a smartphone? Because yes, yeah. a flip phone, you know, not necessarily a problem. Any child that has access to uh, unlimited internet is like giving a razor blade to a baby. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's just the way it is. That's how how pervasive the porn uh, issue is in our world today. And for a parent to be as reckless to give their child a smartphone uh, at any age, in my mm. opinion, without parameters or controls on it is 
you're basically feeding into the destruction of your child's Absolutely. mind. Absolutely. And as yeah. a church, we should never be in a position of playing catch up, okay. you know, yeah. with the world or, mm -hmm. you know, when we put our children out there, whether it's school, giving them a phone or anything like that, the education should come from us internally okay. before they go out. Oh, yeah. perfect. Because mm -hmm. that's why this program, um, I designed it to be educational about when do you start implementing that education to your children and when is too late, mm -hmm. you know, when is it too late before they've already heard things from the world and from the educators of the schools. And I think that it's important to start that dialogue from the moment they can understand simple concepts. And in Sabbath school, we have that, you know, they talk about the ark and they put a rainbow on the wall and they have all of the stuffed animals in this, you know, this makeshift ark and they start talking about mm -hmm. these stories. But I don't think that we have really um, drained all of the truth that's in those simple stories that we give in cradle roll mm. when we could really start to affirm identity and sexuality even from the creation story mm. that's right wow. mm. so if i could uh, yes. that's why i have this program mm. called who am i and mm. uh, basically talking about uh identity and sexuality there's a quote that i have from um thoughts from the mount of blessings page 138 it says in the road to death the whole race may go with all their worldliness, with all their selfishness, their pride, dishonesty, and moral debasement, there is room for every man's opinion and doctrine, space to follow his inclinations to whatever his self-love may dictate. In order to go in the path that leads to destruction, there is no need of searching for the way, for the gate is wide and the way is broad, and the feet naturally turn into the path that ends in death. And so as I've been, you know, doing this ministry stuff for 10 years, I, it's important for me to um, not only to find out why I also was transgendered, even at my first conscious thought, and how to talk about um, addressing that in a sympathetic and a compassionate way. But I have parents that also come to me talking about how their, their sons or their daughters, uh, they think may be struggling with transgenderism or homosexuality and to approach that in a biblical way and also in a way that can actually draw them into uh, God's ideal, I think is real important. And so now, you know, we have these books. I put up this image of Jacob's new dress mm -hmm. as one of the books that is designed to teach preschoolers. Mm -hmm. So even before your children get to school, they're already educating your children on identity mm -hmm. and sexuality and mm -hmm. how fluid that can be. And, and how old are you when you started um, questioning your sexuality? Great question, because I had, my very first conscious thought was, I'm in the wrong sex. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I communicated that to myself, but that was this big conflict. And I think that that's what became this obsession for me. As a little boy at four years old, I just knew mm -hmm. that I wasn't like my sisters, but I wasn't like the boys in school. Mm -hmm. And I completely felt isolated in my identity. And then I was reminded by the boys that I didn't measure up because they called me sissy, queer, and fag. But then as much as I tried to imitate and emulate my mother and my sisters, I knew that I didn't match them either. So I was really trapped in this um, purgatory of identity, mm -hmm. but I couldn't deny the fact that I was drawn towards playing with dolls. I wanted to wear the pretty dresses, you know, boy shoes were only brown or black mm -hmm. and the girls had these really pretty purses mm -hmm. and beautiful dresses. So that was where my focus was. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember it ever being anything different. So that's also why I bought into the narrative that I was born this way. Mm -hmm. How could I have come up with those thoughts on my own? Mm -hmm. right? See, I ask mm -hmm. that because a lot of the testimonies that I've heard, um, people who have those struggles start young or they identified right. with that young, right. whether they're gay, transgender, or whatever the case. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering where the problem is really coming from. Is it that the child can't understand the concept or it's the parent who has gone through life, maybe seen the struggles of people like that, or I don't know, have maybe a confused understanding of sexuality themselves. So it's like, Really, the adults projecting onto the kids, or maybe they're not understanding the innocence of the kids to understand simple concepts. Well, Candy, that that takes a lot of unpacking, and we did that in the transformed um, program that we did. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, they're flashing mm -hmm. it under the mm -hmm. screen somewhere. Yeah. But if you could even watch that program in conjunction with this one, I think that that really helps to uh, answer some of those questions, mm -hmm. not only from my own personal experience, but also from uh, the experience of Marissa and and Ray, as we mm -hmm. talked about before them. So we have a, a lot of those. But I also want to talk about um, the fact. Let me go back here. This is another pre-school uh, book talking about my princess boy loves his dad and his dad tells him how pretty he looks in a dress. His dad holds his hand and tells him to twirl. My princess boy smiles and hugs his dad. All of this is designed to to change the way that we think about identity and sexuality and to plant those seeds in young, impressionable minds. 
You see, as a child, I didn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. Mm -hmm. I also didn't know what my favorite color was. It changed from day to day. Mm -hmm. So when you tell a child that doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality, that they can change their sex, they wow. can change their identity, you are planting within them these seeds of um, confusion and also uh, unrestrained identities that I think are really going to have uh, a, a huge impact on our world in in just a few years. I think this really speaks to the power of a book, though. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is almost like proof in the pudding that they're sitting there saying, hey, look, if we just actually incorporate these ideas into little kids' books, we can actually change the mindset down the road. And it's like, for anybody that's like, oh, whatever, it's just entertainment or it's just a book or whatever. So, so wait a minute, this Scotty. is how people you so, know, learn things. Right, right, right. So how many times do your children come to you and, Daddy, read this book? And you're like, I've read that 14 times yeah. like, already right. today, right? Right. right? But that's the power of what that influence has. And, and what implants a principle more than when your mother or father, the most important yeah. people in your mm. life, are reading that, that to you and affirming that to you. You know, that's even that, that even brings up a whole different can of worms here because it's like if your parent, if you're a parent and you're reading, I mean, whatever, sorcery, mm. magic, whatever, you're you're kind of putting that stamp of approval on that subject. Well, that's Absolutely. what you read to me when I was a kid. Dad. Yeah. I thought it was okay. Mm -hmm. That's know? interesting. Yeah. So it, it it for me, you know, the neuroscience really comes to mind. You think about mere neurons, and particularly in your case, I think this is striking because where's the father figure, right? Mm -hmm. So what do kids do? They're biologically wired to do what they see. Yeah. And in your case, what do you see? You're surrounded by all women. Yeah. So that that's what you're, that's the behavior that you start modeling and, and oh, they did this, so I'm gonna do this, and they did that, and I'm gonna do that. And so that, I think, is why you know, God has put um, both parents. I know as a parent, like, of, you know, I have a little girl and I have three boys. If I go to work on something at home, my boys, they start looking for tools and they're going to fix something. Why? Because dad was doing it, you know. So whatever you're doing, your child is modeling. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always tell people, you know, if you want them to go to church, you want them to read your Bible, you want them to pray, you need to do all those things. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. So in uh, England alone, there's a thousand percent increase now on transgenderism among wow. children. Wow. And they're not uh, moving children percent. to embrace their biology. They're indulging these children to embrace what's in their mind. In what, their, was their, hmm? what was that number? What was that number? One thousand percent increase on transgenderism. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the program that I have that um, I was speaking at an academy that had a kindergarten through sixth grade. And the things that I share with the the teenagers are not appropriate to share with young people. Mm -hmm. And I understand the challenges, especially for parents today. You know, how young is too young to expose them to identity and sexuality? So we were just going to leave out this age group. And I thought, no, wait, if we have books that are targeting our young children even before they go to school, right. we should be doing this even before they get to school as well. Mm -hmm. We should be doing the same mm -hmm. things. And I believe that we can do that in cradle role, in primary classes, in kindergarten as our children are developing. But we have to be a little bit more intentional. We have to make sure, you know, how many colors the rainbow has when you paint it in your Sabbath school class. And, mm -hmm. you know, not just talking about that they went into the art two by two. And, and we'll discuss that a little because I want to kind of go through this program. Mm -hmm. So basically on the first day with the children, I decided that, um, that if they gave me just a half an hour with young kids because their attention span is pretty short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want to make it simple. And then every day you can kind of like build on things that you've learned the day before. And the whole idea is to affirm to them God's intentionality. And then we end on day five with God's love and his compassion towards each one of us. Because again, I thought that God rejected me and mm -hmm. I thought that he was playing a joke on me that he made me a boy and not a girl. So I think it's most important to end with God's affirmation of each one of us. So let me go through this just a little bit. So on day one, I basically asked the kids, am I a zebra? Of course, they say no. Am I a giraffe? Am I a dog? Am I a cat? And of course, you know, kids are so simplistic. And yeah. you can use this mm -hmm. very quickly. And they go, no. And they all <clears throat> shout out, no. Yeah. And I said, girls and boys, that was what we are. And then I go to the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female. Now, using this as an opportunity to affirm to the kids that, listen, you're the image of God. Yeah. It's not that you're a giraffe or a dog mm. or a cat. You were created in the image of God, and he did that through 
two kinds. Mm -hmm. And what was that? Male and female. So I say, okay, all the boys stand up and the mm -hmm. boys jump up, you know, and, and kids love anything that's expressive mm -hmm. physically, you know, right. so yeah. you get them involved in, help them to understand the principles at their level that they can relate to. So the boys jump up and they're all, you know, kind of like knocking around or whatever and standing up there. And then I go, oh, if you're a girl, stand up. So then the guys drop, you know, and the girls mm -hmm. instantly stand up and they laugh. And the, you know, the room was full of, um, wow. you know, a lot of animation. And so again, just getting them to understand those differences. So then Genesis chapter one and verse 10, creation was good, but when God created man and woman together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He stood back and he said, this is very good, very Genesis mm -hmm. 131. Mm -hmm. Why was it so good? Why was it different than the creation days? Because God implanted his very image in the relationship between a male and a female. Now, you don't want to share with your kid any more than they're able to handle, and you certainly don't want to teach them about sex, but you can tell them that the, that the relationship between one man and one woman, like mommy and daddy, was the express image of God in the creative process of the two of them together, and mm -hmm. that this was very good. So again, we go through a little checklist. How many kinds of people did God create? Two, a man and a woman together, right? And then God told Eve, Adam that Eve was to be his wife, and marriage was created in the Garden of Eden. And again, all you're doing is you're affirming God's principle that one man and one woman in a relationship together. Boom. Very simple, right? Mm -hmm. So then God then told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. And you don't have to go through the steps, mm -hmm. but you want to be honest with your children. You don't want to say that you were found under a cabbage patch yeah. or that the store, store brought yeah. you in because <laughs> yeah. just like the Santa story, exactly. yeah. they find you out that start, it's not true. that's right, and then you're not credible Discredit. anymore. Exactly. You are not yeah. a credible yep. um, example of someone mm -hmm. that I can get answers from. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I know when my kids were younger, uh, my daughter in particular was one to ask more questions and, mm -hmm. and it was like, well, how did we, how did, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. And, you know, she told her, well, you know, it takes a mommy and daddy and God made a way, you know, <laughs> it was a very simplistic, uh, but age appropriate answer. It's so. perfect, Keith. It's really perfect. Yeah, my daughter knows that, you know, when a woman is pregnant, that's a baby in there and, and that they come out, she knows where they come out at, but she doesn't know how they get in and she's never really asked. She's 10. So, oh, I, you'd be, I'm, yeah, you'd be surprised. Maybe you took maybe the, 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 the information's been volunteered. <laughs> Time to sit down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you're taking the route my mom took. She's like, "Oh, you never asked, so yeah. I never like really discussed it with you." I learned it very scientifically in biology. So maybe this is a good time to kind of share this one story that really impacted me and my colleague to the point where we were in tears. You know, what do you give your kids? And I think that that's a good principle. If they're not asking. Why give them more information than what they're ready for? We were speaking at a um, pastor's retreat, and we were doing a question and answer for all of the pastor's wife. And this woman who, who was very conservative and a big fat smile on her face, and after we were done, she came up to us and she goes, oh, I understand everything that you were saying. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, mm, lady, I don't think you have a clue you know, <laughs> what we've been through. Mm. And she just started to explain. She said, you know, when I was a young girl, I said to my mother, mother, I want to see a naked man. And that's exactly what anyone else would be like, whoa. But the mother did not respond with shock. But instead she said, well, I don't really have a naked man to show you. I guess we could ask your father. And the daughter, you know, she said, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to see father naked. So the mother didn't overreact. And the yeah. minute that you overreact, you've lost your ability to be objective, right. mm -hmm. and the child can feel judgment or rejection mm -hmm. from that or fear that maybe what I'm saying is wrong, and then they start worrying about, can I say this to my mom? So we have to be very careful about our reactions, but the mother mm -hmm. reacted in such a beautiful way, and she said, well, you know, men are hairier than women, men have more muscles than women, and, and, and like you said, she gave her just enough information that she was asking for, and that was it, and mm -hmm. that seemed to suffice. So this, this young girl was growing up. She had younger brothers and sisters. She was cleaning out a house, you know, as a church mission project, opens a cabinet door and finds a poster, a centerfold of a naked man, mm. you know, a lumberjack. And that's all I'll say. So she pulls the, the picture off and she hides it from her brother and sister. But what do you think she did with it? Ran to her, Ran to her mom. mom. She went to her mother, who was mm. a trusted source. And she goes, look, mother, a naked man. And the mother again, you know, didn't, like, oh. didn't know react. Like, oh, that's disgusting. And oh, you're yeah. terrible for looking at mm. that. Instead, yeah. she said, well, you've always wanted to see a naked man. And there he is. And then she went through an anatomy course and they discovered, wasn't I right? He's got more hair than, than we do. He's got mm. more muscles than women do. But once she affirmed all of the physical attributes, 
I love this. Mm -hmm. She said, but look at his face. Mm -hmm. What's he doing? Well, he's smiling, Mother. And she said, what do you think he's smiling about? I don't know. Do you think he loves Jesus? Do you think he's a Christian? Mm -hmm. Do you think mm -hmm. he's married? Mm -hmm. Do you think he holds the, the door open for his wife? And then That's the tears good. started coming down my face as I realized that this mother was, was what's the word for it, very realistic yeah. and very clinical about something that was very dirty and disgusting, but she didn't shame her daughter and instead she did the checklist of the anatomy, but then she took it to the spiritual aspect. Right. Mm -hmm. And what was so amazing is what a lesson that was to teach our children that they can come to us with anything at any time mm -hmm. and that they'll get a legitimate answer and that the mother and father has an opportunity to make it a spiritual application. Mm -hmm. And that was such a beautiful story to me. I wish that it could have honestly gone to my mother and my father and just mm -hmm. shared that was struggling with this identity inside that nobody wanted, that I seemed to be drawn to. And if I could have had those answers at a very young age, and if my parents had the tools, I might have had a different reality. And mm -hmm. so that's also the idea of this program teaching your children young that they can come to you and that you're trusted. But not yeah. just that, to all, for them to also think for themselves, ask mm -hmm. themselves questions, not just yeah. see something and maybe react or ingest it, but to really ask and walk through, is this something good, is this something bad, mm -hmm. paints a bigger picture than mm -hmm. just what's in front of them. I but like I, that the end result was really to focus on, on you know, the, 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 yeah, the thoughts and the mind and what's this person like and not mm. just like the physical outside of somebody. Well, yeah, instead really of just of... being like, oh, he's an attractive man, I'd marry him. Well, would right. you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. how's he really going to treat you? Yeah, it's yeah, more yeah, than just guy. looking nice, you know, or whatever. Yeah, I like that too. Sure, sure. There's so many aspects. And you can start at the youngest age and then as time grows, you know, goes on, you're, you're teaching your children even more principles about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, the family is a blessing from God. All of this was in the Garden of Eden when it was perfect, before sin even entered. Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. So there's a distinction between the two kinds, but there's definitely different definitions of that. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus was given to Joseph and Mary, male mm -hmm. and female parents. All of this is an example of the intentionality of God was in his design. Beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So God has given us the gift to create life. I love this principle. Mm -hmm. Because this is where I think even as an adult struggling with the identity issue, how do I explain this through our ministry in a way that is biblical and compassionate that goes against the tide of what we're getting outside in the world is to talk about the fact that God gave the gift of creating life to one man and one woman in a, in a committed relationship, right? Not only is that beautiful in itself, but it also is the example of a creative God giving the gift of creation to man. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. That's huge and that's yeah. really profound. And I think that we we miss that point sometimes, especially in light of identity and sexuality. So now we move a little bit. Uh, we know that Satan was an angel mm -hmm. and that the angels were created above human beings, right? Mm -hmm. We understand that. Mm -hmm. We also know that in Isaiah 14, 14, that Satan wanted to be like God. Right. And so he wants the attributes of God. So imagine how angry he gets when he realizes mm -hmm. that God bypassed the angels who were created higher than the humans mm -hmm. and he gave that gift of creation wow. to human beings right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i don't know about you but you know mm -hmm. i would naturally think hey you skip me to give it to them mm -hmm. right so of course we know that satan wants to steal to kill, kill and, and destroy. to destroy yeah. mm -hmm. what would he want to steal kill and destroy more than anything else your those children. attributes well not <laughs> just ability that. to reproduce right but to kill that gift of mm. procreation and the image of god that was given to us mm. in huh. the opportunity to create That's life mm. yeah. wow. two men sexually together does not create life mm -hmm. two women together do not create life mm -hmm. uh the transgender issue destroys my uh my my uh my genitals to the point where i can't create life all of this is a message from the enemy to destroy that precious gift of the image of god created mm -hmm. in a relationship between one man and one woman in the process of creating life even mm -hmm. the push of uh, abortion being a, a woman's right you know mm -hmm. every way that he can destroy life and make it look glamorous or mm -hmm. whatever another application and this is a really good point to jump in here mm -hmm. mike because um unfortunately i've talked to other nurses that work in a local area where there's a university, an Adventist university and academy. And this nurse told me that the biggest users of the abortion clinic are the academy and the university, mm -hmm. the Adventist university. So wow. it's a huge issue within even our religion mm -hmm. where parents want to cover up the fact that there's been either uh, 
um, molestation or sexual abuse within the home or even by a boyfriend or something. And so to cover up one sin, we commit another sin to cover that up. Wow. Again, what message are you giving to your children right, yeah. if life is so expendable mm -hmm. that you can get an abortion right. to cover up some of these behaviors? And I have friends that are in their 50s now that have raised children but still live with the guilt and the shame of the abortion that they had when they were 16 or 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you. It, it's a very good um, thing to bring out. I'm glad mm -hmm. you, you brought that up. I feel like if you try to cover it up, the truth won't fit. And God mm -hmm. kind of addressed that in the Garden of Eden. After sin, um, Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves. Mm -hmm. What did God do? He addressed it. He removed that and he gave them uh, mm -hmm. His covering. His covering, but it was a lamb's, Lamb. lamb's, lamb's covering. Yeah. I wish you so. were my mother. <laughs> you know, what's so cool is that you're seeing the application of these principles and you're also seeing the, um, it's not just enough to tell our kids what the problem is. Mm -hmm. We have to also show them what the solution is. And yes. we have to do that through a loving example of who God is rather Absolutely. than a God that covers everything up. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, awesome. very excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is, this is even better than I thought. <laughs> so everyone is unique. On the second day, we want to talk about the fact that everyone is unique. We mm -hmm. do a little review, have the mm -hmm. boys stand up and the girls stand up, talk about the review of yesterday that God's mm -hmm. image was reproduced, you know, in each one of us but that everyone is unique and that every one of us has a fingerprint, right? Mm -hmm. But did you know that each one of us not only has a fingerprint, that we were individuals totally unique from the other, but only two kinds, male and female, mm -hmm. but that each one of us has an internal fingerprint mm -hmm. that far beyond what you can see on the outside is on the inside. Mm -hmm. My DNA tells me right. that I'm either a male or female. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Yeah. And so no matter what we do on the outside, we cannot disguise the fact mm -hmm. that our DNA is just as much of a fingerprint of who we are, either male or female. And of course, with other uh, characteristics that makes us different, even from our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So talking about that, again, doing a little review about girls and boys, biology tells us who are who we are. DNA is our internal fingerprint. It's unique and different for everyone. And there are two kinds of DNA male and female. So now we want to start talking about something that's very personal to me because when I was in school and being called sissy, queer, faggot, and all these words, I want to really stress to children that it's important to acknowledge these two kinds and how to identify as those two kinds. And many times we have in our, in our mind that there's only one way to be a guy and that's to be a macho guy that, you know, yeah. is so macho that nobody can ever attain to that, that level or whatever. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right, right. <laughs> very good, very good example. But there are differences for male. There are some men that are macho men. Like there's you, you? Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then there's some men that are gentlemen. Yeah. Romantics. Okay, all right. So this is perfect. So there are many ways to be a boy. And we talk about there's some guys that like sports, mm. you know, and then there's some guys that like to play the piano or play instruments or, or more artistic. But that doesn't make them any less of a boy. That's right. And I think it's important to note also that the Bible says that our words mm. have the power of life and death. That's mm -hmm. right. And to affirm your students, like mm -hmm. if you're a teacher, uh, if you're a parent, if you have a child that's a bully, or if you have a child that's being bullied, mm -hmm. I think it's important to, to let your children know either way that if you're into the sports or whatever, that's okay. But if somebody else is into the piano or the arts, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. There are many ways to identify as a boy. Yeah. I think as a, as a parent, how you speak about you know other kids like if you mention you know oh this other kid did this or mm. that yeah, I mean, you have to fear. be you have to be aware of that your kid then it can go into that same mode and talk about other kids like that too and so that's probably where a lot of the bullying comes from sure. it's not organically just because that kid sometimes it's the way the parents were treating that child or something or speaking about other people and and then all of a sudden that child treats those other people and just the way that those kids treat each other can actually have a huge influence on how that child turns out. That's right. So to make sure that I'm understanding you correctly, are you saying that you define the difference between male and female to children at, um, through biology, not necessarily personality? Well, both. I think that okay. they both have a beautiful um, um, combination of who we are as individuals. Yeah. Talking about our uniqueness, and, and you know what, even on this panel, uh, uh, for the guys and then if there were more girls we could tell that there are distinct differences even if you look at the four of us here mm -hmm. you know there you have different likes you have different mm -hmm. likes i do and you do mm -hmm. but we're still all guys mm -hmm. and that's the beautiful thing i think about christianity is mm -hmm. that it is inclusive you know mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be focusing on um the things that make us different or or push us out of the group 
but rather my church has been able to do that for me. It's like they included me in their group, even though they didn't understand me or necessarily relate to what I came from. Mm -hmm. But I was included by the men and affirmed by the men as a man. Mm -hmm. And that in itself, I think, is one of the principles that we should be telling our children. Where did children get that idea of bullying? Mm -hmm. I believe that it came from whatever they're influenced by, primarily the parents, mm -hmm. then the other things that they're exposed to, neighborhood kids or other influences. But I think a lot of times, unfortunately, these, these um, sexual norms come from our parents thinking, oh, you can't wear that pink shirt or, you know, mm -hmm. little girl, you can't wear pants or whatever that is to, to try to lock children into a certain ideal of what masculinity and femininity is. Mm -hmm. So then with the girls, again, talking about their different ways to be identified as a girl. You can be a girly girl or a sporty girl. Tomboy, you can, so. you, that's it's right. You can climb trees. You can also be into sewing and cooking or the arts. So again, making sure that we even play role a little bit. And what are the things that you like to do? And well, that's different than Susie. And Sherry likes to do this, but Susie likes to do that. But you're both a girl. Mm -hmm. And I think that these are really great exercises you can do with children to help them expand their understanding that there are two kinds, boys and girls, but that there are different ways to be boys and different ways to be girls. Mm -hmm. So then we talk about dressing up. Now, did anyone not dress up as a child? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Of course. I, I don't know. I don't know, but I used to take t-shirts and put them over my head and pretend that that was long hair, mm -hmm. you know, pretending again to be the sex that I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that dressing up for a child, not understanding the difference between fantasy and reality, role playing is a very healthy thing. And I believe that it's also a blessing from God if it's channeled in the right way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't want to force people. And, and I love this phrase. Somebody said, Jesus didn't drive, he draws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a parent that called me um, a, a couple of years ago and he said, my son is exhibiting a lot of feminine characteristics. Is he gay? And I said, no. Oh, that doesn't make your son gay because he's effeminate at four years old. He said, but he did say to his mother a couple of days ago, he said, you know, mom, let's do this because we're girls. Mm -hmm. And he feared that his son was identifying with the mom. So mm -hmm. through a series of a couple of questions and I asked him ultimately, I said, well, you know, how much time do you spend with your son? Only child, right? And he said, well, honestly, and I, and I was grateful for the fact that he was so honest with me. He said, right. I really don't like the personality of my son. Mm. And he said, I find myself just, you know, kind of letting him be. And so I come home and my son's in bed and my wife has already taken care of him, you know, throughout the day. And I leave a lot of times before he's up. And I said, the issue more than anything is the fact that your son doesn't identify with you because you're not available to him. Mm -hmm. And maybe your son also picks up on the fact that you probably don't care for his personality. Mm -hmm. So in his defense, he's probably detached from you, mm -hmm. but his mom is there and so he identifies with mm -hmm. her. So mm -hmm. it's very normal for him to say, hey, we're girls because you're the one I identify with mm -hmm. and you're the one that's there for me. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you want to make a difference in your son's life, I said, you have to start taking care of your son. You have to let him know that you're invested. You have to let him know that you care. And you really have to address the fact that you don't like your son's personality. Mm -hmm. I said, you have to be the one that's in charge of his uh, routine at the end of the day. You have to help him out with bath time. You have to play with him intentionally, spend time with him. And I said, and do the things that he likes to do that doesn't compromise that identity of masculinity, but rather draws him into that. Now, my dad you know, saw that I had some issues. And my dad would take me out shooting guns, you know, but I was a really gentle, insecure, sensitive child. So that freaked me out yeah. even more. Well, and, and then my dad took me out to attack train German shepherds, you know, police duty. And so mm. wow. it just it was just way too much. He overcompensated something that that could have been very simple. If he would, just would have colored in my coloring book with mm -hmm. me on the living room floor, mm -hmm. that would have been huge. Mm -hmm. would have been time. Huge. Yeah. And my mother overcompensated as well. When I was mm -hmm. 10 years old, my mother could see I had gender issues. And so. She gave me my father's pornography magazines, mm -hmm. you know, thinking that that would help mm -hmm. me with sexual attraction to women, mm -hmm. but instead it backfired mm -hmm. because as I looked at those images on those pages, I thought that if men love these women, that if I look like those women, maybe men would love me too. Mm -hmm. The problem wasn't that I wanted to be a girl. The problem was that I didn't know how to experience masculine love and affirmation mm -hmm. in a way that was healthy and healing. Make okay. sense? Mm -hmm. So again, so, so I want to tell you the end of that story. Mm -hmm. So after six months, just six months, the father called me on the phone and he said, Mike, he said, I've been taking care of my son, I've been spending more time at home, and just last night my son said to me, 
Dad, let's hide from mom because we're guys. Wow. <laughs> so awesome. just a very simple yeah. exercise of mm -hmm. drawing him yeah. into masculinity, you know, within a short period of time really had a beneficial effect. Wow. Awesome. Isn't that cool? Generally, um, generally, children when they're when they're younger, like probably about, you know, zero to seven, they do have a tendency to latch more onto mom, especially like boys. And then from uh, about seven to 14, 13, somewhere around there, it kind of switches. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then they tend to fixate more on dad. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it becomes more balanced. It's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of seen that in all of ours in the stages. So I've got one who just turned you know, eight and he's been more like, you know, got to spend time with dad, got to go with, go with dad and it's outside and he's talking about getting muddy and he's like, and it was so much fun, you know, <laughs> it's awesome. hilarious. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think as a parent too, um, I have a boy and a girl, so um, it's important. My wife and I actually flip flop and we spend um, individual time with each one just for the almost the opposite uh, reasons as well. Like I want to spend time with my boy so that he can really, um, you know, bond and, and, and we can get close together too. But I also want to spend time with my girl so that she can see like this is, this is the difference between a man and a woman and this is how the man should treat the woman. And, exactly. you know, so it's kind of a, <sighs> it's kind of something that my wife and I have talked about for, for many years. Scotty, that's so valuable because even if your children aren't necessarily interested in that, that specific parent, whether it's a same sex parent or the opposite sex parent, that is still crucial at those early ages. You can't wait until your son is eight years old for him to be interested in you. You still have to make that mm -hmm. investment with mm -hmm. him. And what I love about that is that pubescent girls tend to really start to learn how to flirt with the father if he's safe and mm -hmm. if he's in the home, because that's how they're going to learn to interact with the opposite sex. And the same thing, you know, a, a son's heart during the puberty years is more towards the mother because now he's interested in the opposite sex and he really wants to know how they click and how they work. Mm. So all of that is just healthy um, maturing, but all of that begins at a very early age. And, and I think that that's ideal. Not only should you do things as a group, as a family, but also each individual child needs time from both parents, mm -hmm. the same sex parents and the opposite sex parent as well. Mm -hmm. Something that has come up is uh, there, are, um, there are children that are being raised by, by same sex parents. Mm -hmm. And in particular, there's a, a woman that was raised by two uh, lesbian mothers. And she said, I had a great childhood. You know, my parents loved me. Both women loved her. And um, she grew up in school. But, but it wasn't until she was married and had children of her own that she noticed the interaction of her children with the father that this light dawned on her that children need both sexes in their development. She said that when she saw uh, girls with their fathers at school, she she was jealous of them and that mm -hmm. she wanted to have a father because she didn't understand how to relate to that. She also talked about mm -hmm. how she became sexually active at an early age because she didn't have that mm -hmm. exposure to healthy masculinity and, mm -hmm. and, and somebody that she could identify with. So, and it's not a slam on the LGBT community because let's be real. We know that in this world that's, that's very f fallen and, and fallen apart, that there are many parents that should never have children, whether they're heterosexual or not. And, and I'm not here to slam um, same-sex parents, but, but I think that we were designed and created again. If the image of God was placed in the male and the female together, mm -hmm. you, need both. you need both. You need both for healthy development. So I have a question. Sorry if I'm putting you on the spot, but um, we're living in a very different time now than ever before. So in a situation, in a home where it's a single parent, whether it's a mom with a son or a father with a daughter, and we're not able to socialize the way we used to, do you have any tips on how to help the child have interaction with both? Or Yes, yes. And, and when, when that question does come up in, a, in our ministry after we present at churches and stuff, what about the fact that we have more single mother raising children now than ever before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that now that the pendulum has swung that way, it can never return. Mm -hmm. So how is it that, that boys can have healthy um, male role models? And, and you know what? The church can be a very scary place. We know that pedophiles are mm -hmm. ramp, rampant in, mm -hmm. in churches and in schools. Mm -hmm. And so how can you trust a man to be a male role model for your sons? How can you find a male that would be uh, loving and kind and Christian to your daughters as well if you don't have that example um but i think that god is is incredibly gracious and mm -hmm. i think he hears the prayers of that single mother that's keeping two or three jobs and yet has um you know male and female children 
and to ask God to show you, to bring into your life, you know, an example of masculinity for your sons. Because unfortunately, now the only examples that we have for men about masculinity are rappers and sports figures, you know, and unfortunately, that's not really a Christian example for our boys. And then our girls grow up thinking that they're uh, objects and that, you know, that the only use that they have is their ability to manipulate men through sexuality or sensuality. And again, you know, we have kids that are experiencing sex much earlier, I believe, because of the absence of the father figure in the home or even dual parents. Mm -hmm. So it's a new challenge for the church and, and for people in leadership in the church that are listening to this, I believe that not only should our Sabbath schools be um, directed towards identifying uh, sexuality and identity in our young children in our early Sabbath school classes, but wouldn't that be an uh, excellent ministry to really address the single mothers that are raising children or single parents that have children and wouldn't that be a great ministry to reach out and to help support those mm -hmm. children and get them involved so that they, you know, have healthy examples of what real masculinity and femininity is? So what I'm hearing is you still need kind of that time with a male figure or a female figure, depending on which single parent raised you, maybe. Yes. You still have to have that interaction. Yes, but I, I, an idea that came to my mind, if that isn't the case, if that's hard to achieve, is to just keep that line of distinction very clear. So going back to the story that you shared with the mom and, and her son, and there was that attachment there, and he said, quick, let's hide from dad because we're girls. Mm -hmm. For her to have said maybe, actually, no, I'm, I'm a woman, and you're my little prince, my, my little boy, but yes, let's go hide from daddy. You know, just to keep yes. that be, communication and be straight with him in right. that way. But mm -hmm. apparently that, that was missing because the mother didn't know what to say, mm -hmm. you know, and so she didn't know how to affirm that, but she didn't probably didn't want to ostracize the child even more mm -hmm. because she probably was sensing the lack of interest from the father too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who knows? Who knows? Mm -hmm. There's a myriad of reasons why, and we don't really know exactly what she did say, but this is something that's really interesting. Even in studies, they've shown that even if a child came from my background that defensively detached from the father, even if I had an identical twin brother, that he may have grown up with perfectly heterosexual attractions mm -hmm. while I grew up with homosexual attractions. Mm -hmm. And so some characters can survive in a single family home, even if they didn't have a same sex parent. However, they have shown that there is definitely um, an effect when you have single parent homes and when you have lack of that. All right. Okay. So so let's just address that maybe for a moment that even if you swing to the other side and you're perfectly heterosexual, but you're having sex with every um, girl that you see, that's not healthy either. Yeah, right? right. And yeah. sometimes, you know, guys that grow up thinking that they've been surrounded by femininity, then they think that they have to have sex with multiple girls to prove that they're a man, whatever that is. Mm. All of that comes from, again, the fact that they didn't have a healthy understanding of Christian masculinity and femininity. Right. So as a church, what I'm hearing is, is, is really it would be neat to have more ministries targeting those maybe church members that are part of single families and creating activities or events that, you know, the church could actually step in and fulfill that role. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, but there would have to be some type of a vetting process to make sure that we're not setting kids up to be abused or, right, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a difficult, that's a difficult situation for a church to be in. Yeah. I mean... But it's definitely a ministry that I believe that sometimes churches are able to do that. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe an elder in the church or a deacon in the church steps up and sees a situation. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, one Sunday a month, what he does is he takes the kids out for ice cream, or mm -hmm. you know, he goes over to the house and you know fixes the cupboards that are loose, or mm -hmm. you know, checks the air in the tires for the single mom. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a ministry, but it goes much Absolutely. further because then yeah. that little boy living in that home says, "Whoa." You know, he's not my dad, but he comes over and he helps my mom. And so, you know, you start to learn the principles of Christianity of helping people out. Or maybe even another family can adopt a family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be something? Mm -hmm. You're an intact family, so you and your wife and your two kids go to another family that's mm -hmm. a single family and just bring them to your home every Friday night for Vespers, show them mm -hmm. what worship time looks like, mm -hmm. you know, taking the taking the boys aside, mm -hmm. your son and maybe the son of this woman and saying, hey, we're going to go fishing or whatever mm -hmm. that is. There are so many different ways that we can do that in a healthy environment, but it definitely is a ministry that I think is lacking in our church. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Cool.
All right, so let's go on. This is, you guys are giving me so many more ideas. <laughs> this, this thing's going to blow up. So, so we all like to play dress up, and and you know, it's just a big part, I think, of development. To you know, look at this image. You see a kid being kind of like a bookkeeper, another one a baker, and um, anyway, there's all different kinds of ways that you can dress up, and kids love to dress up. But at the end of the day, talking to the kids, what do we do with our costumes? Well, we take them off and we put them away, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe during the day I can be a cowboy, but then at night I take off my cowboy hat and my stirrups or whatever, and I'm just a regular boy again. Mm -hmm. All of this is healthy, right? I, I, a funny story is my, um, my nephew saw the box cover of, of um, who? Samson, Samson and Goliath. And Samson is wearing like all these muscles and he's holding up this big rock and he's got this strained look on his face like, oh, mm -hmm. like this. Well, my nephew couldn't tell the difference between a smile and a strain. <laughs> and so my, my nephew had this muscle t -sh this yeah. muscle shirt that was flesh colored, but it had muscles built into it. Mm -hmm. And my sister said she couldn't get it off of him. And every day he would walk around the house carrying the sofa cushion over his head, yeah. smiling yeah. Oh, <laughs> like this all day because he was imitating. Yeah you know, um, what he was seeing and he was dressing up as that, mm -hmm. a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. So I talk about it's fun to pretend, it disguises who we are. Mm -hmm. And then I ask the kid, but does it change who you are? Mm -hmm. And of course, children, they're very elementary and very simplistic and we all know, no, it doesn't change who I am, but mm -hmm. you know, it does disguise who I am. And then I go, it gives us the appearance of something or someone else. Sometimes our disguises really fool people. Mm -hmm. So then I segue into Genesis chapter 27. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the story of Jacob. And I ask him, what does the name Jacob mean? Which I love. Deceiver. It's, thank you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing that the Bible kind of explains itself? Mm -hmm. So Jacob is a deceiver. And what did he do? Is he deceived his father. Mm -hmm. So he got his brother's birthright. And lived up to his name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what? How beautiful, you know, in Sabbath school, in your family worship or whatever, really expound on this. The fact that he put the animal skins on his arms so he'd be hairy like his brother, right? Mm -hmm. And how he disguised himself. And he did, he used his disguise in a very negative way, mm -hmm. in a very deceptive way, isn't mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. So disguises can be used in a play and funful way, but it mm -hmm. can also be used in a very negative way that deceives way. people. That's right. So um, again, then going about how we dress also tells people who we are. Mm -hmm. It's right. a costume, right? It's mm -hmm. something that we wear. And so I go to Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, and this is a very difficult verse to really unpack. But if you've established those principles in your children, the differences between boys and girls, and, and those are issues that we could really pontificate about, about girls wearing pants and boys wearing pink or whatever, and I have some you know, definite opinions about that, but that's not why we're having this discussion. But if you're affirming your children into their identity as male or female, when you get to this verse, this is probably a verse that will probably get deeper as your children get older, it says that a woman shall not wear that which pertains unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. As a person who was transgender for 20 years, I was transgender until I was 20 years, thinking that I had to have a sex change for even God to accept me. This is a very difficult verse for people that struggle with what I struggle with because my first inclination is to think that I'm an abomination to God. But when you look at this verse, God does not condemn those that have those feelings. Mm -hmm. He condemns the behavior, mm -hmm. which I think is real important as, as if we want to share the compassion of God. He understands that there are people that have that feeling. Mm -hmm. He says, just don't do it because what that does is that destroys this gift that I gave you. You know, your fingerprint from the inside as well as the outside through my genitals, that, that's what tells me who I am, mm -hmm. right? And so, again... I shouldn't have to show you my genitals for you to know that I'm male. Mm -hmm. So I think that God put this out there saying, just wear clothes that helps to identify which side you're on, right? Mm -hmm. That's a good logical right, right. explanation. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33, it says, For God is not, I'm not the author of confusion, mm -hmm. but of peace. And again, this is we're just at the end of the second day. Oh, wow. This is so cool, you guys. <laughs> so again, the third day. And then I start bringing it into the flood. And, and, and it had to be the Holy Spirit that started bringing me this because... I'm not that crazy about the story myself, and I think that the rainbow is overrated. I Honestly, mm -hmm. I see the rainbow, and it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, again. But <laughs> there's a really powerful opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And and what came into my mind, and I was thinking about, um, as it was in the days of Noah, sh so shall it be at the end of time. 
doesn't that mean that we should really know the story of Noah That's even right. more yeah. Yeah. as we're living in this time? So why did God have Noah build an ark? And the kids said, because, you know, the world was bad and everything had to be destroyed. And I'm amazed that little kids, you know, know the story. And that's because they go to church every week. Mm -hmm. So how many did God call into the ark? You know, two, two of every animal. And I go, wow, that's great. So uh, again, Genesis 6, 19 says, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shall thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female. Mm -hmm. And I said, so, you know, did God bring two boys of, you know, every kind? No. Was it two girls of every kind? No, a boy and a girl. And I go, well, why? Why would God have to bring a boy and a girl? So they can have babies. <laughs> Honestly, we have complicated this issue so much when right. children actually know. So yeah. if you establish the foundation in them and you teach them these principles, mm -hmm. Then when the artificial or the or the um, wow. the manufactured comes up, mm -hmm. you know, about identity and sexuality, your children are already foundationally understanding mm -hmm. that, no, it's a boy and a girl yeah, that makes that children. It was a boy and girl that it takes to create the image of God. It was a gift mm -hmm. of God through the relationship of a mother and a father, not two mothers, not two fathers, that created life. You implant those principles, and then when they're exposed to the other, they'll be able to sort out or at least know that the foundation was God's way, right? Because the reality is they're going to get that wrong picture at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They will. I, mean, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I remember when other kids at school would talk to us about this and it was like, eh. So Scotty, I want to know, how old were you when that oh, started? Oh man, I think I, I think I was probably in the five, five, in five year school? range. Yeah. So I was in public school around mm -hmm. a lot of the neighbors and stuff too. So, I mean. mm -hmm. so Mike, what age for you? Because for me, it was much well, later. I remember. You mean when I got exposed to homosexuality or what? The whole idea of about... Just sexuality or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, just inappropriate. I feel like I don't remember a time that I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but So that's even more frightening than, than my <laughs> yeah. expectation. But I was, I was probably like six or something when I found out what homosexual was. Okay. Because of uh, a friend of my parents in the Army. And actually... He hung out at our house a lot, and those neighborhood kids would be like, your friend's gay or whatever, and I was like, no, he's not. And they're like, what does that even mean? You know? yeah. I knew they were saying it was something bad, you know. Yeah. And then my but that's a perfect said, example mm -hmm. of why if we're having conversations with our parents, you could come home and say, Daddy, mm -hmm. what is a homosexual? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah. you can do it in a biblical way that is loving and kind that doesn't reject your uncle or this mm -hmm. person, but instead recognizing that we live in a world that is mm -hmm. diverse, that has, you know, that, that has strayed away from God's ideal as mm -hmm. we've affirmed what God's ideal is to them. I think it's so interesting you brought up the, the days of Noah and the rainbow because I'm like, I was in the days of Noah and we keep seeing this rainbow, you know, it's like God's promise was this rainbow and, and Satan's like, no, nah, I'm going to fly that rainbow again. I mean, we, we, we could do an entire just talk just on this rainbow. I mean, that that, that is an, an, an interesting thing that that... God was basically saying, listen, because of the wickedness on the earth, I will not destroy it again. And it's almost like now it's used as the symbol of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do whatever I want to. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to destroy it. But you know something? The LGBT rainbow is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Their premise is that the rainbow covers everybody and that everybody should be treated fairly and with love. So that ideal is correct, but it's still a deviation mm -hmm. from what God's intention about the mm -hmm. rainbow is. Mm -hmm. So we're not quite there yet. You're kind of bringing up something that I, I kind of want to ultimately get to. Mm -hmm. uh, in Patriarchs and Prophets, it talks about the beasts of every description, the fiercest, as well as the most gentle, were seen coming from mountain and forest and quietly making their way toward the ark. This is what really grabbed me. Mm -hmm. Animals obeyed the command of God. Guided by holy angels, they went in two and two unto Noah into the ark. Mm -hmm. Noah didn't even gather those animals. They That's just right. came to him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I was living in the antediluvian world and mm -hmm. I saw animals two by two coming from the mountains of all kinds going to the ark, mm -hmm. something's going to happen. Yeah. You know, something's up. Yeah. Something's sure. up. And you know what? I believe that because we're not talking about this, mm -hmm. we are not a testimony to the world about what's coming, what's soon to break upon our world. Wow. But even this, it says that the animals came, male and female. It wasn't that Noah's decision. Mm -hmm. Noah didn't get to decide who he was going to take or what. God himself brought 
them to the ark that Noah created. Mm -hmm. And so then I talk to the kids and I say, all right, so who got on the ark? And they go, Noah and, and his sons. And I go, was that all? No, their wives. And I go, why did he need their wives? So they could make babies. They understand this, right? And we're the ones that complicate mm -hmm. it for them. And, and it was just a, a beautiful expression of that. And then how did God preserve the animals to continue uh, to have life after the flood? Mm -hmm. And again, using these images, you know, show your children in nature God's plan. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to teach your children about identity and sexuality? Take them to a farm. Mm -hmm. You know, if your kids are in the city or whatever, they need they need a field trip to the farm to show it takes a male and a female. Like, you know, the differences between a chicken and a rooster. And it takes one of each to make an egg or a chick. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in the lion kingdom, you know, the male lion looks totally different than the female lion. Mm -hmm. And yet it takes both of them to create this, this life or this cub. Mm -hmm. I believe that because of science, because we've got in vitro fertilization, we can, you know, take a, a, a sperm and, and fertilize it, the egg and put it in anybody that we want. And you can create whatever you want. And so in essence, we've kind of made ourselves to be like God. But really, you cannot create life without a male sperm and a female egg, no matter who you put it inside of or who you say their parents are. Mm -hmm. and, and again, bringing this back down to the basics, I think is really beneficial for children to understand that growing mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Now, this is really interesting because um, in today's world, we see um, this very thing uh, being countered, I guess. You know, you, you start to see scientists are like, I, I've never heard of this talked of before this time. But like, yeah, there's this certain class of dolphin or or seahorse or whatever. And and they, you know, they have a male male relationship or a female female relationship. And it's like they're it's almost like reaching or grasping. I mean, maybe there's something that changes along the way. I don't know. But it's it's certainly not the rule, you know, if it is, if it, it's this biological anomaly, it's certainly not the rule. And it's like you 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you never heard that, you know, it was like, oh, now we need that example because we're trying to propagate this information. Mm -hmm. Like, where was that before if it was so important, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I, I have heard about the, the seahorse thing, but I like this comedian, Jim Gaffigan, he said. You know, it was just some stubborn scientist. He's like, oh, that's that's the uh, male seahorse. Like, it's having babies. The male has the babies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like, I mean, you should just say, oh, it has the babies. That must be the female. But some stubborn scientist, no, male has the babies. <laughs> mm. Well, I, I like that you brought that up, um, Keith, because I think it's real important that um, the children understand that. And you can use the Bible to really help to explain that. When, when God created the earth, he put Adam in charge of the animals. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that 6,000 years of degeneration have not only had their effect on humans, but also on the animal kingdom. So I've also um, been asked that question, and my response is, I don't take my examples from the animal kingdom mm -hmm. as to how I'm to live. Yeah. You know, God right. put man in charge of the animal kingdom. However, through sin and through, you know, we have lions that kill animals and eat them exactly. but we know that in heaven that'll never happen so sin has affected not only humans but also the mm -hmm. animal kingdom so but I, also, I also think it's a bad scientific experiment if you're taking one example out of the millions that are this way yeah. and you're saying because of the one now that's that's the rule whereas like you know the majority of of the animal kingdom operates underneath this you know male female has a baby some species are asexual. Yeah. I can't breed yeah. with myself. Yeah. So you can't really make, make the rule out of the, you know, sort of minute, minor changes that we can't explain. Right. So another point that I want to make about that is that in the animal kingdom, they do not have the frontal lobe that we have. Mm -hmm. And in the animal kingdom, uh, the act of procreation for them isn't an expression of love. An, ex an expression of self-preservation yeah. and also um, um, genetics or whatever. But when it comes to human beings, God was very specific that he gave us much more than just procreation to mm -hmm. keep the world alive. He did it as an expression to know the image of God expressed in a relationship between one man and one woman. He's the one that was the, the maker of us, and he also knows what's best for us, but we're different than the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. We have more emotions and, mm -hmm. and, um, and what's the word for it? Not just emotions, but 
uh, spirituality. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, let's talk about that for a second. Sex is an act of worship, you know, mm -hmm. and that's going to freak everybody out that's <laughs> watching. But sex is an act of worship because, you know, in the relationship between one man and one woman sexually, this is God's ideal and design to bring the image of God in that creative act, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible it's, says whatsoever, what is it? What you what eat, it? what you drink, mm -hmm. whatsoever, whatsoever you, you do, do yeah. all to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but let's take it just a little bit further because even in satanic rituals, yeah. that there's all kinds of sexuality being expressed there, mm. whether it's bestiality or homosexuality or necrophilia or pedophilia, pedophilia, whatever it is, anything that's sexual outside of God's design is there to create an environment of worship. Yeah. Mm. Isn't that interesting? And mm. I never thought of it really to that extent before, mm -hmm. but anything, whether it's pornography, masturbation, premarital sex, mm -hmm. whatever that is, all of that is an act of worshiping either God or the enemy. Or yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I never expected to bring that up today. But. <laughs> so again, on, on day four, here we are day four. And remember, parents, some of this stuff you don't want to share with your, <laughs> your four-year-old. But uh, I think it's important that as you watch this program, that it should help you to start having those conversations with your children, no matter what age they are. And it should start at, at the earliest age that they can understand whatever they can. I think this so, is amazing. What you've shared so far, I wish would be done at every school. Yeah. This is neat. Who yes. knows? Maybe even the adults will learn something. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean right? what age are we talking about? The age of appropriateness to bring things up. Like, are we talking four, five, six? All right. How about it? How about, let me give you an instance. Um, a parent has a little boy and the little boy comes out of the shower, you know, and he's, he's just been bathed or whatever. And all of a sudden he starts pulling on his genitals. And of course, you know, it's not, um, it, it's not a moral issue or whatever, but it can certainly lead to that early on. So a parent sits her, your little boy aside and just confirms the fact that, you know, Jesus gave you your fingers and Jesus gave you your nose and your ears, but he also gave you that. And he also asked that you not play with that or whatever. That's something special and private or whatever. And the little kid like learns, okay, well, I don't pull on that. And, you know, you put your kid in his pajamas or whatever, but teaching your children at the earliest of ages what mm -hmm. God's principles are and not in a way to shame them, but to help redirect them into mm -hmm. healthy sexuality and identity. Mm -hmm. And then when that child was a little bit older, when he got to be eight mm -hmm. years old, the mother and the father sat the child down and started to talk about uh, hormones and how they're going to be surging. And mm -hmm. usually at the age of 10, you start having these changes in your body. So before it happened, they didn't just wait for their child to go through puberty mm -hmm. and then talk about masturbation and pornography. They warned him ahead of time when they felt that he was ready to receive that information. It breaks my heart when, uh, when we go to uh, different churches or schools and, and parents actually um, refuse to allow their children to be in our programs mm -hmm. because they want to protect their innocence. And unfortunately, um, no matter how old we are or whatever, as our ages have gotten younger and younger, you've been exposed more and more to sexual things. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, through the web and through neighbors and through kids experimenting and kids having access to pornography, they start imitating what they watch on their father's or mother's pornography or on their own devices. And we have children that are as young as four and five, mm -hmm. you know, imitating sexual acts that they've seen and heard, mm -hmm. you know, when mm -hmm. I didn't even think of sexual thoughts until I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. Does it hold true that if they don't know, they won't do? Not, not, not true at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some people like that woman, you know, she said, I don't know why I was obsessed with seeing a naked man as mm -hmm. a little girl. Mm -hmm. You know, she doesn't know what, um, mm -hmm put that in her heart or mind. She doesn't remember ever being molested or abused. But if that does happen, we as parents should not be disgusted or, mm -hmm. or um, shocked, but instead mm -hmm. use it as an opportunity to guide their little minds mm -hmm. and their little hearts mm -hmm. into the way that would be biblical and loving. The, the way that I remember as a, as a young child being exposed to um, sexuality was uh, we were actually a family that had a boat and went to a lake and went water skiing a lot. And we went and we took our dog one time, who was only a single dog at our house, and he was a male dog. And so um, right in front of us as a little kid, I remember he had gotten a hold of a female dog and, you know, did what dogs would want to do. And as a child, I mean, I was like, what are they doing? <laughs> and my mom said the entire ride home, I was just like, question, 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 question. <laughs> like, does it hurt? Why are they yelling? What is <laughs> <laughs> like I wouldn't leave it alone and so my parents at that point had to you know talk about it but but it was because I'd seen this thing in nature and mm. then now it was like well well 
what else does that? You know? That's right, that's right. And that's basically I, how I got my education um, from early on. That was organic. You know, that's the way that life happens. And, you know, you got to be ready for that at any time. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't expect that your dog's going to, mm -hmm. you know, find a female dog when you go on a, a family mm -hmm. outing, even if it's a Sabbath yeah. afternoon. Mm -hmm. But when it happens, again, I just keep taking my example from that mother that she she saw the situation and she used it as an opportunity to not affirm, not only affirm what they're seeing, but also to make it um, spiritual and a biblical application of identity mm -hmm. and sexuality. There's and, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. Okay, there's a text in, is it First Peter? Always be willing and ready mm -hmm. and willing to give an answer to what you believe. But I think mm -hmm. for parents, always they be just ready don't and willing that, right? yeah, to mm -hmm. give an answer about whatever might fly out your kid's mouth. But mm -hmm. I remember as a, as a kid, uh, there was a saying like, if you don't understand it talking about sex, then you shouldn't be engaging in it. And if you can't explain something, then you really don't understand it. So mm -hmm. ho hopefully having that understanding of what you as a parent are engaging in and being able to talk about it in the simplest way will help you approach it with your kids. Yeah. yeah. And some of the really valuable conversations that I think go along with that is also um, about, you know, when you wear your clothing, you know, what does physical touch look like between boys and girls? Mm -hmm. and, and to establish those boundaries, because I see those boundaries even less defined um, mm -hmm. in kids that are in academy. Yeah. It, it was it was not uncommon to see a girl with her head in the lap of another girl and they were friends and the girl might be stroking her hair but now i'm seeing it in behavior with the guys in the guys dorm mm. which is brand new but now that we have these these boundaries being broken down about sexuality and identity you have guys that are experimenting now with with things that are are stimulating and that's what they do and we're seeing behaviors that that i think are invading the personal space of what christians should engage in naturally anyway. So uh, again, teaching your children at that same age that, you know, you don't ever touch anyone where your clothes are covered and, mm. you know, what's appropriate clothing, what's appropriate touch. And if somebody is coming towards your child, you should teach them, run to mommy, you mm -hmm. know, run to daddy, you know, because I hear so many stories of children that have been abused that felt that they were bad and they were afraid to come to their mother and father. And so they endured the abuse wow. for years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm thinking that their parents would, mm -hmm. you know, uh, be upset at them, them upset. or something. Yeah. Be yeah. angry at them, punish oh, them, yeah. or not believe them. Yeah, and see when abusers know that information as well, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, you always want to make it a safe space for your children to come and chat with you. Absolutely. So again, then talking about the farm life and, and what it means to, you know, go to the farm, show your kids, you know, if fortunately for you, it came for you, you know, your, your dog and, and this female dog gave you an example right there. But if you don't have that opportunity, you live in the city, take your kids to the country, you know, when they're two and three or five or seven or all along that age to remind them about God's intentionality about identity and sexuality. Yeah. Don't start looking up stuff on YouTube. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about the rainbow, and I think that this is um, a p very pivotal part, and, I, and it, I think it's going to get a lot more personal, you know, for all of us uh, when we start talking about that, because we have something that was given to us by God, and I think that um, that even in its most innocent way, it's been deceived and mis been misunderstood. But I think that it's also important. Kids love color. They relate to color, mm -hmm. and and unfortunately, I was somewhere in Europe, and I was giving this presentation. And we went down in the basement, and I looked in the cradle roll room, and don't you know they had a rainbow, but it didn't have enough colors. Mm -hmm. And so isn't that sad that, you know, even in the Sabbath school room, we could be giving the wrong impression of what God's ideal is. So what do you mean by that? Found. What do you mean that there weren't enough colors? Still Let's talk that? about that. Okay. All right, so what does the rainbow represent? And we talked to the kids, and um, go to Genesis chapter 9, and verse 13 to 15, talking about the rainbow after the flood. I set my bow in the cloud, and there it shall be for a token of a covenant. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I didn't even realize this until I found this verse. Hilarious. It's a covenant, mm -hmm. and a covenant is an agreement between two parties. Mm -hmm. I'm not dragged into this agreement. I have to be willing to decide that, yes, I'm in this covenant, but it's also God is the other one in this covenant relationship. And he says, and it shall come to pass that when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, mm -hmm. and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. So it's a covenant. The rainbow is a covenant, an agreement. And what Jesus says, if you love me, keep, keep my, my commandments, my right? And, and I think God did this because you think about man's natural reaction is just going to be out of fear. Like, yeah. you know, oh my goodness, God's going to just destroy us. 
yeah. if, if we don't do what he says. I got that image is, as a kid. Yeah, and this is God saying, like, hey, listen, like, like I started over fresh, but I will not do this again, you know, and that way we can still choose to obey him, you know, not just out of a sake of fear, but just, you know. Scotty, I love that you bring that up because I want to segue at the end of this presentation to really exemplify the love of God because I think a lot of kids like myself think of God as kind of a scary individual and if you don't do it my way, you're dead. And I, and I think that a lot of parents put that in their kids sometimes with these ideas about identity and sexuality in a way that they think is going to protect their kids, but also in another way, may actually be doing more work for the enemy wow. by mm. making God appear as someone who's judgmental and critical and rejecting. If, mm. if God was like just really angry and, and wanted to take care of the situation, he wouldn't have waited 120 years, mm. you know? Right. Oh, that's a good point. So, so you want because, to bring that out. Yeah, because he, he built in this space of time of 120 years, you know, Noah is preaching and laboring and they're seeing the ark go up and you know by the time you get to the animals it's like this is this is way towards the end of this thing mm -hmm. so you know if god wanted to obviously he could have just been like yeah we're done you know flood time yeah but he didn't do that and and i don't know if it really took noah like i mean did it take him 120 years to build the ark or you know, I mean, that seems like a long time to build something like that. Maybe it did. Maybe he was just kind of pacing himself slowly, slowly. Maybe he was part of the know. union. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know. Like either, wouldn't hear, you know. Yeah. Right, right. In either case, God gave humanity a long time to turn. And, and that ark was open for anybody who wanted to get on. But and, Keith, those are those are the same principles that you should be sharing with your children as well. Those are mm -hmm. beautiful ideas to to start showing your children that God was patient. He wanted to make sure that everybody could mm -hmm. get on the boat that wanted on the boat. 120 years. Wow, a kid, a kid can't even fathom a year, let alone 120. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. those principles are perfect, I think, for every parent sharing with their children to understand. All right, so I bring up the rainbow, and the rainbow has seven colors. And for somebody in the gay culture for over 20 years, you know, the rainbow to me was kind of tired. And um, anyway, as a Christian, recognizing that God uses the number seven in a lot of really profound ways. Mm -hmm. And um, as a Christian coming in, I thought that I had to be perfect. And that was the image that I got as a young person. Also is that I had to be perfect for God to love me. And seven means perfection. And most people agree with that statement. But it wasn't until I really started to understand the application of the number seven, the seven means completion. Mm -hmm. And it means the completion to the process of perfection. Wow. Why couldn't somebody just share that with me? Mm -hmm. And that I didn't realize that even my own journey out of the gay culture, out of transgenderism, out of sexual addiction, out of pornography addiction, it has an application for every single person in the universe, that the number seven is the process of perfection. It took seven times for the for the uh, uh, for the captain to dip into the river before he was healed of leprosy. Mm -hmm. Seven times Mary Magdalene was healed of demons before mm -hmm. she was clean of those demons. So it was a process, and understanding that is really beautiful. So if seven represents God's rainbow, seven is a beautiful way to start implementing that principle to your children. Like let's count sevens. You know, like seven what? You know, seven this and the stories of seven that are in the Bible, showing your children that. Sin comes with the human condition, but that the process of perfection is the work of sanctification. Isn't that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that God is going to see you through. And so you may have been really lousy today as a kid. You know, we had a really bad day, but tomorrow we're going to start it all over. Right. And God is going to help us to get to that, that process of perfection. That's a principle that really applies to me even today at 60 yeah. years old. Mm -hmm. And I could have used that at three or four or seven or 10 or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere along that way. And the rainbow is a beautiful way. Put a rainbow in your kid's room, but make sure it has seven colors <laughs> because that's God's rainbow. Mm -hmm. And what was, what does the number six represent? Man. Oh, mm -hmm. where do you get that? Mm -hmm. Because on the man sixth day, man was created, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that the, even the number 666 is the number of a man. So six represents something from man, man's, man's thinking or man's creation, right? Mm -hmm. And so anything other than seven colors in the rainbow is not God's rainbow. Mm -hmm. 
pure and simple. And I think what's really beautiful is you can focus on God's way and you don't even have to address in a negative way any other rainbow that's out there, any other rainbow that doesn't have all the colors. And, and God's rainbow is specific. It has seven distinct colors and in a distinct order. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. So if you see the rainbow out of sync, mm. it's not from God either. Mm. And this is an example awesome. of that, and it took me a while to find that, but it's red, orange, yellow, green, uh, blue, thank you, and then uh, indigo, uh, indigo, and then violet. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it, and it happens in, in that form. And I'm doing a study on the rainbow. Do so you I'm, know what the colors actually represent? Oh, biblically. stop. That, that's another one. That's another one because I have another Bible study that I do where we discover the colors of the Bible, uh, the colors of the rainbow through the Bible. Wow. wow. Yeah, is yeah, that in yeah. the Bible? Like what they mean? It really is. It really wow. is. Wow. It's super cool. All right. So I don't want to digress. But I so wanna... the one that's missing is the indigo, indigo one. Mm -hmm. And the which a, flag. Which is a combination yeah. of... Um, purple and blue. Yes, purple and blue. Thank you. Wow. All right, so so again, talking to the kids, what does the rainbow... How does the rainbow talk about God's love? In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 11, it talks... Uh, it's a covenant between you and me. We talked about that. Uh, the rainbow is to remind us of a promise. Who does the rainbow cover? It covers everybody. And I think that this is a real important point because when we have children... You don't want to go to a store and all of a sudden your kids see a gay couple wearing a rainbow flag and your kid coming up and say, that's not from God and you're going to yeah. go to hell and blah, 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 blah. We need to also let them know that the rainbow covers everybody mm -hmm. and that even if people aren't following God's principles on identity, sexuality, or the rainbow or whatever, it's not an opportunity to criticize them or to set them straight as much as it is to have compassion to recognize that they don't have the understanding that we have. Let's pray for them, right? Let's work for them. And, and, and because too many times I think that we instill those principles that if they don't believe the way we do, they're lost, we're saved. They're bad, we're good. And when you start instilling that in children, I think that that leads us to some of the attitudes that we have in Christianity now mm -hmm. of this condescension about the, the sinner and the saint mm -hmm. when, when really we're all in this boat together, right? The ark. So again, uh, who does a rainbow cover? So uh, Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1, uh, the rainbow that's over um, when Jesus comes to take us home. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Mm -hmm. So when this, this artificial Jesus comes and shows himself, it's quite possible that there's going to be a rainbow around it, right? Yeah. Mm. Wow. How many colors do we want to make sure that rainbow yes. has? Right? Yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Revelation chapter 4 mm -hmm. and verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And um, there was a Sorry. rainbow round Sorry. about the throne in sight mm. like unto an emerald. So again, teaching your mm. children the beautiful things, the principles of the rainbow, I think are, are really important, especially in this day and time, to make sure that they understand the true rainbow and anything else that might be man's invention. And it's mm. so funny, you can get so deep with the truth, no time to study the counterfeit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So again, how much does God love me? This is the final day, and this, guys, is the most important day, but you cannot have this day unless you've done the foundational work of mm -hmm. laying about identity, right. sexual, all of that was done yeah. in an expression of God's love, mm -hmm. not because it was a bunch of rules that he gave us to arbitrarily follow because he's God mm -hmm. and he can do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. It's because this was a gift. And this, this story came to me profoundly through Marissa's story because it was through reading Psalms 139 that she discovered that it was God's pursuit of her that brought her to an understanding that her gift of being female was really just that, that it was a gift from mm. God. Mm. So again, uh, talking about in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Mm. And before you came forth out of the womb. That, that really expresses that, you know, God has an intimate relationship even from the very onset. He's knit us together, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, he, and, he, and he has a relationship with us, you know, from that perspective. Mm. Amen, amen, I totally agree. So starting with Psalms 139, and Psalms 139 is really the, the whole chapter that encompasses to me identity, sexuality, and, and everything from God's hand. But first, in verse 5, it talks about how you have protected me in front and behind. You have laid your hand upon me. Now verse 10, it says, your hand will lead me and your right hand will hold me. 
in verse 17, it says, Your thoughts towards me are precious, O God. Your good thoughts about me are too many that I can't even count them. Mm -hmm. When you start telling your kids these verses, mm -hmm. you are leading them up to such an affirmation yeah. of an expression of love that mm -hmm. came from God's hand. It's not that he just made you male and you and female, and you've mm -hmm. got to just suck it up and deal with it. Yeah. Instead, it was something that God wanted to bless you with. And in his pursuit of you, it's like, you know what? Kenny, you're the one that really needs to be a female because God has a special work, a special plan for you. And this is how he saw you. And it wasn't given to you as a work or a condemnation or a joke. It was given to you as a special mm -hmm. gift mm -hmm. because of his love, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that in itself also helps people to deal with when we have confusion. And you know what? There are people that are confused about mm -hmm. their identity, mm -hmm. of which I was one. Mm -hmm. And and it's reasonable to, to know that even in a Christian school, there are going to be children who are going to, be confused about their gender identity or about their sexuality. Mm -hmm. So we have to be sensitive about that. And I think that if we use this in a correct way, if we use this loving approach, if the children see that you're loving too and that you are not biased, then they'll be able to come forward and say, I am confused sometimes too, or mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body, or mm -hmm. I feel like I have attractions to the boys in school, you know, when I'm in gym class or whatever. And when you have that coming out in a family situation, then imagine what you can help to protect your children from when they hear it on the outside. Mm -hmm. And then imagine the parents that aren't surprised when they start to realize that their children have gender identity disorders or sexuality you know, confusion because they came to you first, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't mm -hmm. a surprise. It wasn't a, a, a big mystery because they trusted you enough to come to you and let you know what they're struggling with. Mm -hmm. Now, we have this movement in the church that is basically saying that it's okay to be gay and that that's how God made you. So wouldn't it be awful if we as parents lost that precious opportunity mm -hmm. to affirm what God's ideal was for our children and to help guide them mm -hmm. biblically, spiritually, mentally? And if, we, and if we misguide our children into thinking that it's not an issue or it's not a problem with God, you've not helped your children yeah you've created a bigger problem for your wow. children, right? Yeah, and not only right. are they in a situation where they could be, no other word that I can think of, you know, lost, but then what about the responsibility for the parents when we get before God and God says, what did you do with those Oof. children that I gave you? That's mm -hmm. right. Right? And let's be real, it's, it's hard to not be biased. We all have our own perspectives, mm -hmm. our own life experiences. I think that's the, the place, the role of the Holy Spirit right there, to have mm -hmm. that connection with God personally before you try to reach out to other people. Even right. your kids. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. There, there was a situation I sat down with um, a young man and his mother, and we were at lunch. And this young man had um, had gone through the gay culture and struggled with um, same-sex attraction. And he was biblically with the understanding that, that God was going to heal that and God was going to give him the victory over that. And he was living according to that. And then through his own, um, you know, his own walk, and his mother supported him, and his mother was right there behind him. And so uh, they picked me up, and we went to lunch. And as we were talking, I started to realize that, that my friend's understanding had changed. His position had shifted, mm -hmm. and that he was now affirming same-sex, you know, monogamous relationships. And so after he was explaining to me his position, and I made sure to be extremely compassionate because, of course, he knew my position, and now I'm the right. opposition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I looked at his mother, and I said, so how does that affect you? Like, where, you know, what's your response from the news from your son? Mm -hmm. And basically, she just threw it all out, and she said, well, I trust my son, and whatever mm -hmm. he decides is fine with me. Mm -hmm. And that broke my heart. Mm -hmm. Because now the mother was mm -hmm. not... in a position or a role to basically kind of add, you know, well, you know, this is maybe how mm -hmm. God intended it to be, or, or, or give a little guidance right there. And you affirmed that action right. right so now you're assisting your son mm -hmm. in his deception mm -hmm. and what about the eternal consequences of that decision mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and, and let's not let's not be insensitive to the fact that there are parents out there and, and you know what i talk to them all the time and on our prayer line you know we have situations with parents that are like you know my son won't talk to me or my daughter won't talk to me until i accept their um lgbt life and you know, I love them. I, I want to have meaningful conversations with them, but now they refuse to come to my house. They refuse to bring their children to me. Yeah. You know, it creates a, a big um, resistance in these families if we hold on to the truth 
-hmm. But if we give in and allow them these ideas and directions against what we believe that the Bible says, then in essence, we're really just as much a part of their mm -hmm. their future eternal destiny. But I think it goes back to the communication from when those children were young. Because back to the Garden of Eden, it's not good for man to be alone. Well, it's not good for anyone to be alone. In that isolation, that's probably where the child just couldn't really grapple with these different ideas or went down the wrong path or wh whichever path they chose, it's, it was in that isolation. So as they're growing to continue to isolate themselves from their community, from their support system, I mean. Good point, Candy, because um, I, I think that that needs to be addressed as well because a lot of parents experience extreme guilt. Mm. You know, maybe you weren't a Christian when you had your children. Oh. Maybe you were converted when you were, you know, in your 30s and your children were in their early teens. Mm. That's really difficult to start implementing those principles now when maybe you were LGBT uh, affirming and, you know, whatever that was. But he here's the thing that I really want to be clear on, because regardless of what you, you gave to your children or what you weren't able to give to your children, God still makes up the difference. That's right. And, yeah. and it doesn't mean that we throw out the truth so that we're loving and still connected to our children. By affirming the truth, you're giving your children something to come back to. Remember, it says, "Raise up your children in, in the, the way they should go, in the way that they should go, yeah. and when they are old, they will not depart from, from it." it. Yeah. And somebody said this to me, and I thought it was so wise. They said, "If you don't lay out the foundation for your children, they'll have nothing to come back to." Oh, mm. wow. wow! Isn't that that's something? A, can't a, come back a, to what you don't have. <laughs> yeah, that's a deep thought right there. I, wow. So I want to pull you back to this because all of this, I think, is culminating for exactly the point that we want to make. And and your your perspectives have really helped me to really solidify exactly what I believe this is so um, profoundly supporting. But Psalms 139 and verse 16, your eyes saw my form and being incomplete, all my members are in your book, which you made when before there was nothing. Mm. And then verse 23 says, search inside my heart, dear God. Look inside me and know my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And you know, for the child that struggles with same-sex attraction, the child that struggles with um, gender dysphoria, you know, this is a very real verse. And when you unpack this with your children, listen, you know, to let your child know that, you know what, there's a lot of things in me that God is still working on. Mm -hmm. And when a parent can apologize for their children and say, mm -hmm. I did this wrong, I want to do this right, all of that is teaching your children that, hey, it's okay. I can share the fact that, I'm, that I made a mistake or that I messed up you know, and that God wants to help me. You're teaching your children through your own example, through your own repentance and reformation, how your children can do it. Mm -hmm. And when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, more than what you say is how you live that saying, you know what, mm -hmm. daddy messed up again, and mm -hmm. I shouldn't have said that to you. Mm -hmm. Can you ever forgive me? And mm -hmm. let's pray to God. And, you know, mm -hmm. you're teaching your children have a, how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up in a, in a family where you had to do the things that were right. And, mm -hmm. you know, dad never apologized for anything. And dad was perfect. And yet I could see his humanity. And that was far from perfect. Mm -hmm. So when 19 years old or 20 years old, when I walked away from the church, it was basically because I didn't have an example of somebody having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It was either you serve me and bow down and obey me or you're lost forever. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, well, I can't keep your law, so I'm out of here. Mm. And, and I think, again, parents have this opportunity to to, to embrace these, these scripture verses and to reaffirm that, you know what, son, Jesus loves me and mm -hmm. he forgave me. Mm -hmm. You know what, there's nothing that you can do that he can't forgive you too. And when mm -hmm. a father exemplifies mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. when a child is really bad and yanked a handful of his sister's hair out, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know, to show the son how to go through the process of repentance and forgiveness. I think it's also important to show your children that you do make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And what do you do when you make a mistake? How do you rectify that? How do you come back? And yeah. that God will take you back. And so for you to admit, I messed up, I did it wrong right here. You know, I have a part to play in whatever has resulted um, and I'm sorry for that. I think that, that, that verbalization of that also helps the children say, oh, well, then you can ask for forgiveness and God can actually, you know. It's practical you Christianity, there. Scotty. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. practical Christianity. You're mm -hmm. teaching your children how to have a relationship with God and to teach them that when you mess up, that you get back up and you can come to God mm -hmm. as you are mm -hmm. and He promises to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. So, my, the last verse, or next to the last verse that I want to share is. Psalms 139 again, verse 14, I will praise you 
for I am fearfully mm -hmm. and wonderfully mm -hmm. made. Your works mm -hmm. are marvelous. They're not just good. Mm -hmm. They're marvelous. And that my soul knows it very well. Mm -hmm. When you say a verse like this, guess what? I can't reject my biology. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about transgenderism, mm -hmm. we're not talking about somebody that was born with a uh, birth defect. And you know what? Mm -hmm. We live in a world of sin. Mm -hmm. 6,000 years of degeneration. There are lots of people that were born with ambiguous genitalia or mm -hmm. deformed or whatever. People born without arms, without legs. And we know that we live in a world where, where, where sin has been developing or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about somebody transgender, they're completely male or completely female. We're not talking about anything in between. We're talking about a psychological rejection of that biology. And so when you add this verse to that, a little child that may struggle with identity, but when you have the same-sex parent affirming that child and drawing them into that identity, then you back it up with the fact that Jesus, you know, knows that you were meant to be this little boy and that he fearfully and wonderfully made you, you know, then you have another affirmation. And, and you, what, I, what I noticed from you, Kendi, is like you have like one idea and you think that a lot of that is based on that one idea. But none of us are just one idea. We are so complex that we have many influences, not just how we were raised, not through those Christian principles that we did or didn't get along the way, but we have many areas that affect how we shape our identities and mm -hmm. our personalities. And this is just another affirmation of that. What you get from your parents, what you get from your brothers and sisters, from your teachers, from the people in school. So if teachers and the church and the families all had this resource, Imagine the way that we could help to affirm and to build healthy identities mm -hmm. in our children growing up along the way. Wonderful. Ah, okay, last verse. Psalm mm -hmm. 139, verse 15. My body was not hid from you when I was made in secret. Mm -hmm. You knit my delicate inward parts together in my mother's belly. Mm -hmm. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't mm -hmm. that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Oh, and look at this last one. Remove all my sin and lead me to heaven. That's how it ends. Isn't that mm -hmm. something? Mm -hmm. Remove all my sin and lead me to heaven. Even my thoughts can be wrong. Mm -hmm. Even my thoughts can be simple. And understanding the creative and the blessing that God has put inside of each one of us through our biology, it makes sense that mentally or psychologically, we may separate from the intention of God that he gave to us in our identities and our bodies, mm -hmm. but God can bring it all back together. Mm -hmm. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Mike, what a, what a great conversation today. So from what I'm hearing from you is there is no time that they're too young. You are actually teaching and training, even though you may not talk about the mechanics of sexuality, mm -hmm. you're affirming in the way that you just you know, interact with your children and the things that you talk about. And through those more complex conversations as they get older, you're then teaching them really the true model of sexuality. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> and, and I think that, um, that the sooner parents realize that you're teaching your children about sexuality and identity from the moment that they're born. You know, when a little sister is watching you change a little brother's diaper, you can point out the differences, and that's not a sexual thing, and mm -hmm. that's not going to awaken some sexuality in your kid, but it's just going to say, you know, it's just like the dog that wasn't neutered that runs around in the backyard. What are those, Mommy? Well, you mm -hmm. explain. Mm -hmm. You know, well, you know, the girl doesn't have that. The boy does. All of that in its in its biology is not a dirty thing. Mm -hmm. That's the what life is, and it's mm -hmm. a beautiful opportunity to start instructing our kids from the earliest time that they notice that. I, I like your story, Scotty, that mm. you know you, you came home and you're asking your, your parents all these questions because you were ready. You were mm -hmm. ready to know more and you were inquisitive and that should not be squelched. Mm -hmm. yeah. When a child is inquisitive and has questions, mm -hmm. they deserve to know the answer and they shouldn't be put off like, well, I'm your father or it's not time for you to know that or mm -hmm. whatever. Let them know what they need to know so that they can understand the question so that they're not seeking somebody right. outside of the home to get the information from. Yeah, I think you're also affirming the Bible along with this. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, this is the book we go to to get our answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the answers are there. And, you know, with the abundance of answers that are out there, those answers are essentially denying the validity of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And they are essentially saying that what God did, he did in error, you know, and then from that point, if, if God is wrong or in error, where do you go then for any of, the, of your problems? Mm -hmm. Wherever you want. Yeah, That's and why you certainly don't go yeah. to God because he didn't do things right from the beginning anyway. Mm -hmm. 
And then, you know, then, you know, that leads to a whole multitude of other issues. Like, now what do I do with my sin? Mm -hmm. It takes me back to that quote, what you said. If you can't trust God, then you're up to trusting whatever you want, whatever somebody else says, whatever construct you can create. And, and so I'm going to bring this back to something that, that um, I shared um, just recently. But I was at this uh, Freedom March, and it was a group of 500 people that were all together. And, and we were um, all sharing how God had led us out of the LGBT lives. Over 500 individuals, right? Wow. And yet, even in my own denomination, I couldn't find that kind of, of unity. We were all unified on the Word of God, which is what you're talking you know, mm -hmm. about. Everything has to do with our relationship with God and, and every aspect of our lives. When we show our children that God is good and that He's loving and kind and that He's truthful and it's, and it's something that you can rely on and it's uh, immutable, it doesn't change, then that's what I experienced at this group, the Freedom March, where there were over 500 people of multiple denominations, but we were standing on the same verses and we were all in perfect unity. Mm -hmm. I believe that that's what God is looking for in our parents as well as our churches and our schools, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I think that, that, that little curriculum there is beautiful. It and is awesome. It's, you know, really has all the important foundational principles for the kids to learn along the way. And, you know, as they get older and ask questions, you give them the age-appropriate responses, you know. So until 30, they get 30 minutes the, a day for five days is what this is? Mm -hmm. yep. I love it. Yeah. Super cool. Awesome. I love it. When's it, when's it going to be a, like a book or a little book? I can't believe you that you said that, but um, <laughs> and especially as a parent, I really respect that that that's your um, that that that's beneficial to you because I'm not a parent and I've never been a parent, but um, I really feel for children that struggle with identity issues because of my own experience. Um, but we are working on a resource. Awesome. To have this. Okay. Yeah. I want it for awesome. my daughter's school. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we hope that you guys were blessed by today's talk. I know I certainly was. And um, if you want to look more into Mike's ministry, coming out ministries.org, mm -hmm. right? And uh, Mike's got a lot of valuable resources on there. But thank you for coming. And we hope that you guys uh, like this video. Share it with anybody that you think would benefit from this topic. And we'd love to hear your comments about this. God bless. Visit our brothers at schoolforprofits.tv and watch From Babylon to America, which has over 5 million views on YouTube alone. And follow it up with America to Babylon. Check the description below for links to this and more.